Now we come to chapter 13, and we've come to an altogether different section, and the tone changes immediately. From chapter 13 through 23, we have here certain burdens. In fact, burdens on nine surrounding nations. Now, burden is something that you bear, and it's the judgment of God upon these nations. Now, there are nine of these nations that are mentioned, and this, in many ways, is one of the most remarkable passages of Scripture, because most of it's already been fulfilled. It was prophetic when it was given, and it is now already fulfilled. It's a matter of history. Now, Each one of these nations had some contact with Israel, and most of them were actually contiguous to our borders. That means they were near at hand. Their border touched on the border of Israel, or they were not very far away. And Israel suffered at the hands of some of them and will suffer again in the future, and by the way, is suffering today at the hand of some of these same nations. We're going to find some names here that are strangely familiar. Of course, Egypt being one of them. Now, notice here, before I get to the text, let me say another thing by way of introduction. It is yet future for many of them, but the fact that some of it is fulfilled, and this is one of the great proofs that this is the Word of God, is fulfilled prophecy. Now, that makes these 11 chapters very important. And we're going to find out, we saw in the other section, that Assyria was the oppressor. But here, it's going to be another set of nations, by the way, headed up with Babylon. And the burden here is a judgment. And you could exchange the word burden here for judgment, and it'd be just as accurate. Now, actually... This section was not a section that made the prophet popular. The prophets did not enjoy delivering this type of a message. This was not the way to make friends and influence people. And a great man will say it's not the power of positive thinking either. But any bearer of bad news is not seeking a popularity contest at all to win in it. Now, The first burden here is against Babylon, the judgment of Babylon. We're talking now about the literal city of Babylon. And this is remarkable because in Isaiah's day, it was a very insignificant place. It was not until a century later that Babylon became a world power, and God pronounced judgment upon Babylon before it became even a great nation. And... This section does not end with the burden, actually, on nine nations, but it extends through six woes in chapters 28 through 33, and then it concludes with the calm and the blessing after the storm. And again, we have a millennial picture in chapters 34 through 35. Now we have here, then, in this chapter the punishment of Babylon in the day of the Lord. I believe this looks forward to the great tribulation period for its final fulfillment. And then you have here the destruction of Babylon in the day of man. Now, the first one was verses 1 through 16, and this is verses 17 through 22. And here you have ancient history fulfilled the great tribulation, and then ancient history fulfilled. Now, will you notice, the first burden here is against Babylon, the judgment of Babylon. That's the way it opens. The judgment of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Now, this city of Babylon here, it became one of the great cities of the ancient world. In fact, It is the first great world power, and so recognized by Daniel in the seventh chapter and also in the vision of the image. Daniel could say to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou art the head of gold. The first great world power. And it was a great world power. Now, this future city 
uh, Babylon is to be actually, I should put it like this. It was future when this was given, but probably we ought to put it in our own time zone, and it would be that Babylon will be rebuilt. And yet it says it'll never be rebuilt. What do we mean? And Babylon also, we'll see it here, is a symbol of the united rebellion against God that began at the Tower of Babel, and it will end over there when we get to the 17th and 18th chapters of the book of Revelation. We'll see religious Babylon and political Babylon that rule the world in the great tribulation period will go down in a great judgment from God. Now, this is the first, probably, the first mention of it in Scripture. He says in verse 3, I have commanded my sanctified ones, I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Now, sanctified here does not quite mean what it means to us today. We've given it, shall I say, always a Christian connotation. It didn't have that always. All that the Word means, that which is set apart for a specific purpose. And when it's set aside for a specific purpose, and it's God's purpose, then it is something that makes it very special. And all it means here is that God has raised up Babylon for a specific purpose. And the same thing that he did for Assyria. Assyria, God said, we saw it two or three chapters back, O Assyrian, rod of mine anger. God says, I'm going to use you to punish my people, and then I, in turn, will judge you. And that's the same thing about Babylon. What a remarkable thing that you have here. Now, we are told that Anything can be sanctified if it's set apart for the use of God or of God's creature. Verse 4 and 5 of First Timothy 4 reads, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. How is it being set aside? And that's the reason that we should pray over our food. Thank God for it. That is set aside for the strengthening and nourishing of our body. Now, that food is no different than any other food, but it's now to be used for a special purpose, you see, and it's to be set aside with prayer. Now, we have here this nation of Babylon is set aside. God will use the Babylonians just as he did the Assyrians as instruments for punishing his people, and then God will judge them. Verse 4, The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustered the hosts of the battle. And this makes clear, I think, that what we're talking about by the word sanctified, they're going to come down to accomplish God's purpose and they'll take the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity. Now, verse 5, They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Now, the Babylonians will be God's instrument. Now, he says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Now, this Prophecy now looks beyond anything that's now history, and it's speaking of that day, the great tribulation. Therefore shall all hands be faint, every man's heart shall melt, they shall be afraid, pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them, they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth, they'll be amazed one at another, their faces shall be as flames. Behold the day of the Lord coming, cruel both of wrath and fierce anger. Now, the great tribulation, when again this power will come in the last days, called Babylon here, and it is a power that will destroy these people, just as Babylon did in the past. Now, we have it identified with the great tribulation, verse 10, 
the stars of the heaven, the constellations thereof shall not give light. Now, you have that prophesied again by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, 29, Revelation 8, 12. I will punish the world for their evil. The world is coming up for judgment. You and I are living in a world today that's moving for judgment. And then he says, I'm going to make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. And the minute Christ died for you and me on the cross, that added value to us. It's a time of worldwide destruction, these days will be. And no flesh would survive unless those days were shortened. But God will preserve a remnant to himself. Now, he says, I'll stir up the Medes against them. Now, who are the Medes here? Well, the Medes under Gabrias are the ones that destroyed Babylon, by the way, the Media Persian Empire. Here the prophet goes to the immediate, you see. Verse 19, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. Now, that means that it was the greatest kingdom that's been on this earth. That is, a worldly kingdom. And there's been none, really, to compare to it. The Greco-Macedonian Empire was great. The Egyptian Empire was great. Roman Empire. And we think today that probably our nation and Great Britain at one time could have claimed to be a great nation. But I do not think that any could compare to the glory that was Babylon. God's Word here calls it the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, all you have to do is look at the ruins of ancient Babylon to recognize that's happened. Here is a great city that was never built back. Now, other great cities were built back. That is true of Jerusalem especially, and it was true of many other great cities that came back. Rome was destroyed, but Rome was rebuilt also, and that has been true of others. The great cities in Germany that were bombed out, absolutely obliterated, they are back. I flew over Frankfurt, then flew out of the place, Frankfurt, Germany, and I want to tell you, that city was leveled but it has risen out of the ashes, a great city. But Babylon has not arisen. And God said that it shall never be inhabited. But Babylon is to be rebuilt. And actually, this prophecy looks on to that Babylon. And Babylon represents confusion, and it will be the great commercial center, the great religious center, the great political center, the power center, the educational center of the world again. And this looks on to the time of judgment then, just as ancient Babylon went down. Babylon would not have to be rebuilt where it is today, that is the ruins. It's about 14 miles from the Euphrates River, whereas the Euphrates River actually went right by it, and a canal from the river went right through the city. Now we read here, Verse 20, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Now, why? Well, there's a superstition. Several of the men of the past who've excavated in Babylon say that they were never able to get the Arabians there, the Arab, to stay in the camp inside the ruins. They all went out and stayed outside. You say that's superstition. Sure it is, but that's what they did. And the interesting thing, God's Word said that they wouldn't pitch their tent there even. Now, that's a very interesting prophecy. Verse 21 says, "...but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there." And they found lions that make their home there, by the way. "...and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures." And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs, and the word satyrs, demons, shall dance there. Now, if you want to go to a dance of the demons, that's where you ought to go. They have here in Southern California a church of Satan. I see where a girl came out here to take the final course and becoming a witch. Well, this is the place to come, I would say. But a young fellow that 
claims he belongs to that church. After a service, he was present out here. He came up and very vitriolic. He attacked me, and he mentioned the fact that demons were real, and he worshipped them. And I agreed with him, demons are real, but he better be careful about worshipping them. And he said that they were about. And I said to him, have you ever danced with a demon? He looked at me in amazement and said, no. I said, well, I'd tell you where the dance hall is. It's over there in the ruins of Babylon. I said, why don't you go over there? Brother, if you're going to go halfway, go all the way. And may I say to you, I think this is quite accurate, by the way. And I've said it rather facetiously as I talked to that young fellow. But I think this is very accurate. And I can't go into that. Verse 22, And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Now, that looks forward to the destruction, actually, of the future Babylon that will be built here upon the earth. It will become the great center. I think the man of sin, the willful king, we call him Antichrist, will finally reign in that place. Now, friends, last time we were talking in the 13th chapter about the burden of Babylon. Well, That continues here in the 14th chapter. And we saw that the burden of Babylon actually was a judgment of Babylon. Now, we are in a section here where about, I think it's nine nations that we'll be looking at that are brought before us, and the judgment of God came upon all of them. And there's more, actually, than nine. I think that we probably go up to 11 nations. And these nations were nations that had something to do with Israel. Either their borders joined or else there had been either friendship or they were an ally or an enemy of Israel. Now we saw here Babylon was taken up first. Babylon was the head of gold. In image, the first great world empire. And we saw that the punishment of God was to be upon Babylon in the day of the Lord. And then the destruction of Babylon in the day of man. And that is already history, and it has been fulfilled. Now we come to chapter 14, and it's merely a continuation, actually, of chapter 13. It has to do with Babylon. But here in this chapter, there's some other things. We see the kingdom established here after the final destruction of Babylon and the origin of evil and its judgment and the burden of Palestinia or Palestine. Now, great issues are at stake in this chapter. The origin of evil and the judgment and the final removal of it from this earth is the theme of this section. And you have local situations and nations are the expression of these worldwide themes and eternal issues. And this chapter looks at nations and the problems of this life through the telescope rather than placing them under the microscope for inspection. This chapter opens on a joyful note because of the final judgment of Babylon. And the kingdom is established with all fears and dangers removed. No enemies of God is abroad. The judgment here and elsewhere in this book of Isaiah has a word of explanation given as to the reason for it. And we will see here God's plan and purpose for the earth. Now, will you notice this chapter is really a mixture of light and darkness. The chapter changes from the ecstasy of the kingdom to the punishment of hell, Satan and the problem of evil are brought before us. And we have here this extended section on the destruction of Babylon. Great subjects are here, strong contrasts, and we have here this inserted burden of Palestine. Now will you notice verse 1, and you have here the future restoration of Israel and the peace of the kingdom after the judgment of Babylon. And that's in the first eight verses. Will you notice? For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and he'll yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Now, this reaches on down. You see, to the end times, God 
has said again and again and again that the nation Israel is to be restored to that land. Now, I don't think you see the fulfillment of the prophecies there today. But the interesting thing is, that nation, God will restore them. When he does it, they won't have any problem with Egypt or the Arab world, I can assure you that. And they won't need to turn to either Russia, the United Nations, or the United States. The Lord Jesus will reign there. But the interesting thing is that there's so many today that talk about they believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the Scripture. And my, they are loud in proclaiming that. And yet they'll turn right around in a passage like this and say it doesn't mean that at all. It means something else. They're never quite clear just what it means, but it doesn't mean what it says. May I say to you, there's more than one way to deny the inspiration of the Scriptures. The minute you deny the validity of them by denying the reality and the fact that they're literal, then you've denied the inspiration of Scriptures. You can call it anything else you want to. The Lord will have mercy on Jacob. He'll yet choose Israel. Now, the Lord has said that too many times for anyone to say, I didn't quite get it. I think it means something else. Then we're told, verse 2, And the people, and the people here are Gentiles, shall take them and bring them to their place, And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. Then they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Now, friends, that hasn't been fulfilled. The Gentiles are going to return them to Palestine. But they haven't worked toward that end today. They've hindered them. Even Great Britain, when Great Britain had the mandate in that land, forbade them to return even after World War II. But they went in because they had to go somewhere. And that is really a saga of suffering of how multitudes of them went to that land. And Russia today is hindering. And other nations are not concerned with that. Now, the Jews throughout the world are interested in that, and they help any of their brethren to get there. But the Gentiles are not doing it. And I take it that this is not the fulfillment of Scripture. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou hast been made to suffer. Now, they have sorrow in that land today, and they are in fear. I walk down through the streets of Jerusalem and the other cities. Soldiers everywhere. Drive along the highway, they're everywhere. Why are they there? They are in fear. Now, even if things were settled, they'd still be in fear, and I guarantee you that. No rest from sorrow. Verse 4, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. Now, Babylon here represents, I think, the great enemy in the last days headed up in Babylon of that day. And therefore, it represents the enemies of Israel. And Babylon was an inveterate hater of this nation. Verse 5, "...the Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindered." Now, this is the final judgment at the end of the Great Tribulation. That has to take place. This earth must be judged. There's too much injustice here. Somebody's going to have to handle this. Thank the Lord I don't have to. And I'm very thankful that today we don't have to look to man. Now we are told the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. And they break forth into singing. That hasn't happened. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon saying, Since thou art laid down, no fellows come up against thee. After the battle of Armageddon and the coming of Christ, rest and peace come to the earth instead of sorrow. They're singing, weeping is only for the night. The morn of joy has come. We are told as we move on down that all the pomp and glory of man is removed. We're going to see that again when we come to the 17th and 18th chapters of Revelation. Now, we come to verse 12, 
And here is one of the most interesting, I think one of the most interesting sections of the Word of God. And here you have the origin of Satan and of evil, by the way. Now, will you notice this? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? That's verse 12. Now, Lucifer here is none other than Satan. He was created, Lucifer, son of the morning. As we'll find in the 28th of Ezekiel, he is the highest creature God ever created. But he was a Judas Iscariot. He was one that turned on God. Why? Because of this reason that's given here. And this is the fall that took place apparently long before man appeared on the scene. The Lord Jesus says in Luke ten eighteen, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He saw that first fall. And we are told in 1 John 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And we are told over in Revelation there's war in heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, that's Satan, and the dragon fought in his angels. Now, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he is a deceiver. This is a picture now of the very beginning of this creature. Now, what was the sin of this creature created higher than any other? He had a free will. Well, what is sin in its final analysis? Now, I'm not talking philosophically, but now theologically, what is it? Verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. There are five I wills of Lucifer. Now, what is, therefore, sin in the final analysis? What is it? He was setting his will over against the will of God. This is sin in embryo. This is the evolution of evil. There's no evolution of man, but there is an evolution of sin. It began by a creature setting his will against the will of God. As a free moral agent, the creature must be allowed to do this. It's nonsense to talk about a creature has a free moral will and he can do what he wants to, but there's an area in which he can't move. This creature could move in any area. And so this is man's original sin. This is where it all began. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, why is murder sin? Just because God says it? No. Because it's contrary to the will and character of God. Anything that is contrary to the will and character of God is sin. And I don't care what it is. It could be even going to church. I think some people displease God and go into church. And you can do that. The thing is, when a creature sets his will over against the will of God. And imagine a little man down here. A little bitty puffed up creature man is. And little man says to God, I won't do it. I'm going to do it my way. And that's what little man is saying today. We want liberty. We want freedom. We're going to do it our way. My friend, you're not going to do it your way because God's will will finally prevail. The prayer should be for all of God's people, thy will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is going to ultimately prevail. Now, anything contrary to his will is sin and doesn't make any difference what that is. Now, Satan didn't go out and get drunk the first time. That's not what he did. He didn't steal anything. The thing that he did can be summed up in one word, and that is, it was pride. That is, 
an overweening pride, and we want to reduce it down now to the lowest common denominator. What is sin? Anything that is contrary to the will of God. Now, he was created, as we're going to see, an angel of light, for that's what he was. He was the son of the morning, perfect, but he was given a free moral will. He could choose what he wanted to choose. Now, he was lifted up, and lifted up by pride. He then set his will against the will of God. Now, it wasn't the purpose of Satan to be different from God. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be God, in other words. And he put his will above the will of God, and any creature that does that puts himself in the place of God. And there are a great many men like that today. Any man that puts his will above the will of God, that man is making himself God, and he takes the place. And that's what sin is today in the human family. All we like sheep have gone astray. How? Well, from the will of God. We've turned everyone to his own way. His own way. Man's way. There are two ways. God's way and man's way. And that's what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, friend, you are in God's universe today. You're breathing his air, using his sunshine. He never sends you a bill for heat and light, but he furnishes it. And you're his creature, and you owe him a great deal. And you are to obey him. Now, this is what he says to you. He says that you and I, we are unable to obey him. It's not in man to obey God not in man to walk obedient to God. He has to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a poor lost sinner, away from God, and then there's given to him a new nature. That's what it means to be born again. This is a tremendous passage of Scripture. Now, will you note what follows this? God's going to judge him. And I want to tell you, it's a severe judgment, yet Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, you have here the judgment of Satan. And you find out that the Lord Jesus had said that he saw Satan cast like lightning out of heaven. And in the book of Revelation, we see that. And finally, we are going to see that he's cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And that's prepared for him. He is a creature that set his will against the will of God. Now, God is working out a great plan and a great purpose that's far beyond the thinking of any person down here. And it's not for you and me to question. It's for you and me to trust him because he's prepared to extend to us mercy and grace and love. Now, he goes on and gives here the judgment upon this creature that is coming. Now, he says here, Babylon was being controlled by Satan. You remember, Satan offered the Lord Jesus the kingdoms of this world. Babylon belonged to him. But back of Babylon was Satan, back of the kingdoms of this world. This is a tremendous revelation that we have here. And he says, verse 22, For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant son and nephew, saith the Lord. And he says, I will make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water. Now, if you have ever seen the ruins of Babylon or any pictures of it, you can realize how literally this has been fulfilled. That There it stands over there today. It'll be rebuilt in that valley. It'll be a Babylon again, a place of the world rulership. And you'll hear the Babel of voices again. There'll be the tower of Babel against God, lifted against him. 
And again, God will come down to judge. That'll be the final judgment. You see, that's the reason these great truths have been given to us in the book of Genesis, is to let us know what's coming in the future. And he also mentions here in verse 25, the Assyrian. I'll break the Assyrian in my land. And he represents the king that's coming from the north. Now, I want to come down to verse 28. And verse 28, we actually have here the second burden. Babylon was the first, and now the second one. Then the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Now, it came about because of the death of Ahaz. He'd reigned for 16 years. He was a very evil king and a Of course, the people felt like that he'd be followed by an evil king. And, well, they were delighted that they were getting rid of Ahaz. That is the thing that they're happy about. They're going to get rid of Ahaz. There is the bare possibility of a good king. And, by the way, they did get one. We'll see that as we go on into Isaiah. Now he says here in verse 29, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now, there was a good king. In fact, there to come two more good kings after Ahaz. But very frankly... The worst kings are yet to come. And therefore, they're to understand that just the rule of man will not bring about in the world any improvement. We exchange in this country, and my how gullible we are as a people. We feel like if we change presidents or change parties, and I've done that a couple of times myself, I'm going to make an improvement. I've made no improvement at all. And I'm sure you have the same feeling. And in that day, they thought that things would be all right. Now, rejoice not thou, O Palestine, because though Ahaz is dead, things are not going to get better at all. Now, before the kingdom blessings come, there'll be a severe judgment of God and He's looking now down into the future when there will come the Antichrist, there will come the Great Tribulation period. And, well, actually, there are those that believe that this is not so much a burden here. In fact, it's hard to believe that it is, but it is that. Now, the name Palestina is quite interesting. Actually, it refers to those who gave that name to the land. And the ones who gave that name to the land were the Philistines. They had come up the coast out of Egypt, and they had slipped into that land in the early days. They were there when Israel got there, by the way, and apparently were not there in the days of Abraham, because at that time the Canaanite was then in the land. But by the time they returned, 400 years later, why the Philistine had come into the land. Now, this is a judgment that'll be on him. Now, specifically, we'll find out in Zephaniah and in Zechariah that there were specific prophecies against the Philistine country. Ascalon was in it, and Ashdod was in it, and there were specific prophecies concerning these and the seacoast towns in that area. They were to be destroyed, and that was literally fulfilled. Now, this detailed judgment that's here is really fierce, by the way. Now we come in chapter 15 to the third, and the third burden here, or the third judgment, is the burden of Moab. Now, this is a brief chapter, but actually... We have coming up now three chapters that deal with Moab. Now, that seems very strange because we only had two chapters for Babylon 
And Babylon was the first great world power. And Moab, to us today, seems very small potatoes. We don't feel like they were ever very important. But in Isaiah's day, in fact, in the time of David, why, this was a land that was very important. Not only important, but it was a great kingdom. Now, the background of Moab was simply this. We have here the burden of Moab. And it's a sudden destruction of that land. And they have quite a history, by the way. It goes back to the time of Lot. And they came into existence. Moab was a son of Lot through the incestuous relationship with his eldest daughter. And the illegitimate son of this sordid affair was the father of the Moabites. And these people became the inveterate and persistent enemies of the nation Israel. Balak, their king, hired Balaam the prophet to curse them, for he feared them when they passed through the land of Moab. And then you have a very lovely story. The little book of Ruth is named for a woman who was a woman of Moab. This maiden of Moab was a very wonderful person. I have been in love with Ruth a long time. And uh, Ruth I'm in love with is not only in the book of Ruth, but my wife. That's her name. And David, he was part Moabite. For he came in the line of Boaz and Ruth. In fact, not too far back. And David took his father, when Saul was after him, over into Moab. Why? Well, they were related. They had relatives over there. And these people finally became the enemies of God's children. And who are the modern Moabites? The nation has disappeared. Well, these are people that are very close to being Christian. They almost were persuaded. they like Felix and Festus, who heard the gospel. But the king said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. These were not very far from the kingdom, but they didn't quite make it. They were neighbors. Actually, that land today is the land of the Heshemite kingdom of Jordan. And they had Jerusalem in the kingdom. But, of course, in the Six-Day War, Israel took that and moved the border back where it was originally at the Jordan River. And that's where it stands today. Now, the modern Moabite, I think, is easily discovered. He's today in our churches. He parades as a Christian. He's the one that Paul wrote about, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. We're to see that in this chapter and the two chapters that follow that. And then we find that the little book of Jude describes them. Not only did Paul, but Jude described them. He says that these people are ungodly. They pretend to be, but they are actually ungodly. And they're godless sinners, and they're murmurers, they're complainers. They walk after their own lusts. Their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. They flatter you if they think they can get something from you, but they drop you the minute that they think they can't get something from you. Moab was a dangerous friend to have, and they were never a trusted ally of the nation Israel. Now, you have here the judgment that's coming. Verse 1, the burden of Moab, because in the night, air of Moab is laid waste, brought to silence, because in the night, cur of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. Now, silently, and in the night, why, Assyria came down, and Assyria destroyed this nation, and in a way that is unbelievable and almost unspeakable. They seem to wipe them off the face of the earth. And you have here in verse 2, 
certain place is mentioned, and I don't think we're acquainted with but one of them. It says he's gone up to Bajit. You see, he's slipping in during the night. And that means house. And apparently this was the temple of Chemosh that was in that land. And then Moab shall howl over Nebo. Well, that's Mount Nebo where Moses came. And over Medeba. And these are cities in that land. And we are told here that this was the way that they were to be destroyed. They were ones who professed to know God and yet spent their time in a heathen temple and a pagan god and said they were worshiping the living and true God. Now we're told in verse 3, "...in their streets they shall gird themselves with sackcloth on the tops of their houses." And in their streets, everyone shall howl, weeping abundantly. I know that when I was in Amman, the capital, I never had such a funny feeling because it's a weird sort of a place. It's a very poor land, and yet was in that day a very rich land. But today, you feel like the judgment of God is still upon it. And the judgment was so serious that even Isaiah was moved. In verse 5, he says, My heart shall cry out for Moab. His fugitives shall flee unto Zoar, and heifer three years old. And he goes on, They shall raise up a cry of destruction. You see, the heart of the prophet went out in sympathy because of the terror that's come upon them. And in spite of people's sin today, God still loves them, and he will extend mercy if they would but just turn to him. And you have here that follows the detailed description of this, and this is the judgment that did come upon them. It's been literally fulfilled. Now we continue the burden in chapter 16. You have the final overture of mercy offered to Moab, as the prophet looks on to the millennium in the first five verses, "...send ye the lamb to the ruler of the lamb from Selah to the wilderness under the mount of the daughter of Zion." Now, that lamb is to be sent over and offered on the altar in Israel. And that lamb, by virtue of that, speaks of the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And therefore, they were to recognize the God of Israel, in this way. They did not do it, however. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. I've crossed that little river, not much of a river, but they could not get away from the Assyrians. They took them there. Now it moves on into the future, and you see the last days brought up before us. Verse 5, "...and in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David." And you remember James mentioned that in the 15th of Acts when he said that the tabernacle of David was fallen down, but after God called out the Gentiles today in the church... Then he'd turn again and build again the tabernacle of David. That's what Isaiah is talking about here. Now, I mentioned a moment ago the fact that brought them down was their pride. Now, in verse 6, we're told that we have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Now, the reason that God had to reject and judge Moab was because of the fact that pride led them to reject God's proffered offer of mercy. God would have delivered them. You see, they also refused to give sanctuary to the folk in Israel. We find that later on. They stood on the sidelines. And they were judged because of the fact that instead of protecting their neighbor and being helpful to them, why they actually would not let the fugitives come and hide. If they did, 
they'd point them out. So Babylon and Assyria first, and then Babylon could take them. This was the thing that brought down judgment upon it. And again, let me make this application that judgment came, and it came, as verse 14 says in the 16th chapter, within three years, as the years of a hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be contemned. That is, judgment would come in three years. And it did. Assyria destroyed this nation. And this was the judgment of God upon it. Now, why? Pride. That is one of the great sins of today. It was the sin we saw that caused Lucifer, son of the morning, to be lifted up with pride and to lift this throne above the throne of God. He wanted to be independent of God. That was the thing he was after. He wanted to establish his own self-contained kingdom and no longer be dependent upon God. Now, actually, today, that is the position of all liberalism. Those who reject the Word of God, those who reject revelation, Basically, the thing that causes them to do it is that which is in all of our hearts, pride. We'd like to do it ourselves. Most people want a do-it-yourself religion. They like that type of thing, and they want to do it. They want to do something to be saved. That ministers to our pride, you see. And today, you have, I would say, basically, they try to point out this, that, and the other thing, that there's so many church members that are hypocritical, that there are many church members that are very selfish, that there are very many church members today that actually are really anti-God. Well, it all basically rests upon the pride of the human heart. We've turned everyone to his own way. We want to go our way. We want to do it our way. Now, the judgment came upon Moab, and this out-of-the-way nation, entirely forgotten today, seems so insignificant, has a message for us. Now, we come to chapter 17, and we come here, actually, to the fourth burden now. The fourth burden is the burden of Damascus. Now, Damascus was the capital of Syria, and still is, by the way. And you have here really the burden of Damascus and Ephraim in the immediate future and the far-off future. Actually, what you have here is the nation of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel. And at that time, they were lined up together. They were allied together. And more often, came together to come down against the kingdom of Judah. And Damascus was the leading city of Syria. And you have here in chapter 17, now verse 1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Damascus and her ally Ephraim, which are the ten tribes in the north. Now let's look at these names for just a moment. Damascus was the capital and leading city of Syria in that day, just as it is today. It has been called the oldest living city in the world. Well, I've been to several places that make that same claim. You go to, actually, to Greece, way up above Corinth in the Peloponnesus, the city of Menelaus, and Agamemnon, that Mycenaean civilization, that actually was the beginning of Greek civilization. And they tell you that's the oldest place. However, there's not much around there today to call it a town or a city. A good Greek restaurant there, but that's about all. And then I've been to Jericho, and there is a sign when you make the turn down at the Jordan to go over to Jericho, It says so many kilometers over to Jericho, the world's oldest city. So I guess that about every place has the world's oldest city. I've been waiting for my native state of Texas to come up with that also. We've done pretty well with getting everything else in that great state. Why not have the oldest city? And I'm sure that they'll dig it up there some 
where someday. Well, Damascus has a good claim to it, by the way. It was Vitringo who wrote, Damascus has been destroyed oftener than any other town. It rises again from ashes. And we'll see that. Now, Damascus means Syria. Now, Ephraim is the name of a tribe of Israel. It's the name of a city. It's the name of a mountain. It's the name of a man. And it refers to the ten tribes, the ten northern tribes. That's one of the words used instead of Israel, several of the prophets. We will find that Hosea uses that expression, Ephraim. And Ephraim is like a heifer that goes backwards. Well, here it's used to represent the ten northern tribes, which are ordinarily called Israel. Now, here you have the burden of Damascus. And Damascus is to be taken away from being a city. It shall be a ruinous heap. Now, there have been those that say, well, look, this is not fulfilled. Well, I think candidly that, as we have said, that there is a far-off fulfillment of all of these prophecies, and I think there's a local fulfillment too. Now, somebody said, then, how would you understand this? Well, I feel that there are two possible explanations that certainly make sense to me. The first one is that historians are not always accurate. In fact, who was it that wrote the profound history not long ago, and then made the statement that the biggest lies in the world have been historians. Well, historians haven't always been accurate in saying that this is the oldest city, that is, the original city of Damascus, because in that area there happened to be many ruins of a city. And actually, any one of these ruins could have been old Damascus and probably was. Damascus is like a great many of the ancient cities that when it was destroyed in one place, they didn't always build on the ruins of that place. They shifted it over and built it somewhere else. Certain cities they could not or would not because of the fact they were sacred to the people. Jerusalem is one like that. It been lots easier to gone over on the Mount of Olives and rebuilt Jerusalem at the time of Nehemiah. But they didn't do it because of the fact that so much that was sacred was connected with the old city. I don't think that was true of Damascus. And so we just leave it to the archaeologist. He hasn't yet come up with the answer of which one of those ruins will probably have been the oldest city. That's one explanation. And then the other is that It is the oldest city, and it has withstood the ravages of war. And it has never ceased being a city, although it's shifted locations. It is probably the oldest city in the world. But that city which has survived every catastrophe that's come upon this earth, and especially upon that land that has seen army after army march through them, it managed to survive but it will not survive during the Great Tribulation period. It will be destroyed. And as the writer says here, it will cease being a city. It shall become a ruinous heap. And I believe that actually both of these are accurate and both of these are true statements and certainly fulfill the prophecy. They're quite adequate to fulfill it. Now he says in verse 2, "...the cities of Aurifer are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which lie down, and none shall make them afraid." Now, I probably ought to go back and give you another pronunciation of that. The cities of Aurifer are are forsaken. And let's settle for a Aurifer. They are forsaken. And they're going to be his flocks. Now, this was a suburban area near Damascus. The entire area would be destroyed. Now, that probably has happened in Damascus in the past. It will happen again, of course. And we find 
Verse 3, "...the fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts." In other words, the northern kingdom of Israel must bear her share of the burden of Damascus, or the judgment, because of the alliance that they have. Now, we are told in Second Kings that both were besieged by tiglath Pileser, and they were finally both deported by the Assyrian Shalmaneser, and that's in Second Kings 17.6. Now, this certainly was a partial fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, and as far as many are concerned, it's the total fulfillment. I say that all of this is looking even to a future day. But we certainly have a partial fulfillment. And oftentimes, you find that in the Word of God. In other words, God's letting you know it's going to be fulfilled. Now, what we have in the remainder of this is that the judgment is going to be carried out. And I'm not going into detail here because we need to gain just a little momentum now. Verse 10, though, "...because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation." Now, he's talking here to the northern kingdom. "...and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shall set it with strange slips." And what you have here is this. I think that it is something that was literally fulfilled, but it does have a spiritual application, as all of this does. It's to note how this land in our day has been planted with pleasant plants and slips. I had the privilege of setting out five trees up in the land of Israel, in fact, in the tribe of Issachar. They're between Haifa and Nazareth. And the forests of the cedars of Levin have almost been removed. But there are many trees in that land, and the Mount of Olive was covered in that day with them. The enemy removed them. Actually, while the Turks controlled Palestine, they exacted a tax on trees. And so the few trees that were left, the people cut them down and practically all the land was denuded of all greenery. Now, after World War I, England began a movement to plant trees in that land. And the present government of Israel has continued this policy, and literally millions of trees have been set out. Now, there are many of you folk that have seen my message. That is, when I say see it, because it's an illustrated message on what time is it on God's clock. And I go into this particular part, the way that land has been reforested. And yet, I do not believe that's the fulfillment of other scriptures. Now, you have here in chapter 18, you have the next burden, and that's the fifth burden now. And it's the burden of the land beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And actually... There were those that thought at one time that he's talking about Egypt, but he's not talking about Egypt because that comes up next. And that's one kingdom God's not through with. And it's interesting that out of the ancient world, this great kingdom has come down, but has come down exactly as God said it would. You can't guess like that, my beloved. But what do we mean here by the burden of the land beyond the rivers of Ethiopia? And it's certainly no description of Egypt at all to begin with. And then those today that try to bring in England and the United States. When I begin to hear that kind of interpretation, I feel like yawning because they weary me. That's not interpreting the Word of God at all. The fact of the matter is, Ethiopia is the one that we're talking about. Now, there are two Ethiopias. The word that's used is Cush. And there's one in Asia, that's Genesis 2.13, and another in Africa, and that's Exodus 2.15 and 21. I believe we're talking about the Ethiopia now that's in Africa. I'm sure that's it, because it's the land beyond the rivers. And the rivers of Ethiopia was, of course, the Nile River. And what we have here is something I think that's quite wonderful. He says in verse 1, 
And we have here, God calls the world's attention to Ethiopia. That's interesting. Woe to the land, shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Now, the word woe here is an unfortunate word, because actually it's the same word in Isaiah 1-4 that's translated, ah, a people laden with iniquity. It's a sigh, or as you have it in Isaiah 55, ho, everyone that thirsted. And here God is saying, ho to the land. Listen to me. Hear this. That would be the way. Now, shadowing with wings, I think might be better translated, rustling with wings. And that is something that's quite interesting. Missionaries to that land have told me now for years that Ethiopia is known and noted as the land of birds. It's called the land of wings. And this is something that actually identifies it. I have a very wonderful missionary friend over there now. She was a former student of mine. She tells me that that is a means of identification. Now, will you notice? They sendeth ambassadors by the sea even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters. And vessels of bulrushes would not characterize, actually, any modern nation. You couldn't fit that into England or the United States, because we just don't use them. And you couldn't get a steamship out of that, as some have attempted to do. Well, the nation here, however, that is peeled and scattered in peel, of course, is Israel. And what you have here, of course, is, I think, Ethiopia. And he says, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. Now, there have been a great many Bible students believe that this ensign is the ark of the tabernacle that was later on in the temple and that at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, that previously it had been transferred over to Ethiopia. And I'm told there's a church over there that the claim is made that it's in that church. Well, I don't know that. I couldn't prove anything. But an ensign will come out of that land. That's interesting. I don't know what it'll be, and I'm not attempting to say it. It's even what I've suggested. Verse 7, "...in that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and peeled," this is Israel, "...and from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion." Now, this is evidently a reference to the fact that the Ethiopians... See, there's no judgment against them, but what you have here, they will be at Jerusalem. And there's a marvelous verse that I call your attention to in the Psalms, where it says, they're going to ask the Ethiopian, what are you doing in Jerusalem? I guess same question, maybe it's on the account of integration in that day, maybe that'll come up in the millennium. But he's going to say, I was born here, I was born again here. God has wonderful things to say about Ethiopia. I gave a series of messages at the time that Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, saying that God would not let that stand the brutal way in which they were treated. And God certainly didn't. And Mussolini went down, and Ethiopia is still a nation, by the way, and will be right on in to the millennium.